Hello and welcome to worship for Sunday the 23rd of April, the third Sunday of Easter. I'm the Reverend Terry Peterson, Minister of St. John's in Gurich. Our reader today is Elder Rav Gowans, and it is a joy to worship with you today from the holy island of Lindisfarne. God calls each of us in the way we will best hear, bringing people together to serve the kingdom's purpose. God calls each of us with all our background experience and baggage, bringing people together to reveal how far grace can reach. God calls each of us from our certainty and our confusion, bringing people together to worship and to do what is right. Let us pray. You pour yourself out, O God, and we come with gratitude and praise. For you do not wait for us to get it right, but come to us first. You reveal yourself in your word and through your spirit, bringing us into the fullness of your resurrection life even before we know how to ask. Move among us again this day, that we may not only hear you, but be faithful to your call to action. For we proclaim you alive, O God. Your resurrection power is loose in the world. But we confess that we want you only to act according to our rules. And we do not allow you to move beyond the words on the page or the ways you have revealed yourself in the past. We proclaim you sovereign, O God. You are God and we are not. We confess that we have very definite ideas about what you can and cannot do. And we are all too willing to constrain your freedom when it threatens our comfort or tradition. We proclaim you God of all. You gather all people to yourself. We confess that we didn't think you meant those people. And we are surprised to find evidence of your presence and gifts in them. Forgive us, loving God. Surprise us again today with the extent of your grace, crossing the lines we draw, blurring the categories we create, broadening our interpretation of your word. However shocked we may be at the others around your table, may we be open enough to receive the wonders of being part of your beloved community without needing to control it. Bring us alive as you are alive. Set us free in your sovereign freedom. Gather us in with all your children that together we may live as your body in the world. Trusting in your resurrection power, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
The reading today is, is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, reading from verse 1 to 17, then 34 to 48. In Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is, he is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a de devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling him everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. Peter went with them and after two days came to Cornelius' house where he had gathered all his family and close friends. Cornelius explained the vision God has showed him. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to, pay, to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to test the, testify that he was the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. 
for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water from baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. The beginning of this story always makes me laugh, thinking about Peter being so hungry that his prayerful vision is of a picnic blanket covered in live animals, none of which are things Peter would actually consider food. But he isn't that hungry, and so likely assuming this was some kind of test, he refused, only to have God give him that strange message, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. In the Gospels, Peter is often the disciple who stands in for us, the one we identify with as he does his best to follow Jesus with a mix of successes and failures. Peter is the one who blurts out what he's thinking, the one who first calls Jesus the Messiah, and the one who insists that Jesus must be wrong about what's going to happen to him, the one who promises he'll follow to the ends of the earth and the one who claims never to have met the man. How often we are like Peter, hot and cold, faithful and fearful, quick to say yes, and quick to impose our own vision on Jesus. This story is no different how often we are like Peter, faithful and prayerful, committed, and also unwilling to hear God speak a new word insisting that the word of scripture must be eternal in the sense of being closed and therefore finished for all time. Peter knew the word of God. He knew exactly what the scripture said. He knew what that meant for his everyday life, for what he must do and not do. He had built his life on following God's way as it had been taught by Jesus. He had built on a firm foundation. He never expected that God would speak a new word or bring new meaning to the old word. Like many of us, Peter had built on the firm foundation. A rock like this castle is built upon, standing tall and visible from everywhere, strong and impregnable. Especially after the resurrection, Peter must have thought that was indeed the final word. What else could be so dramatically new as bringing Jesus back to life? It turns out that building on this type of rock can be dangerous because if God decides to expand, we don't have any room to go. And we end up having to leave our safe and easily defensible position to find a new place that will fit all that God has in store. In this story, that was people. God had more people to include in grace And Peter's job was to be the one who witnessed God's power reaching out to people who had been excluded by the prevailing understanding of God's previous words. Peter had enough trust in the Holy Spirit to go with the messengers who arrived at the door, and enough humility to stand in front of that crowd of Gentiles, not just Gentiles even, but a commander in the Roman army, And not just a Gentile commander of the Roman army, but one who was literally from Rome itself. Cornelius was an insider in his own world, but an outsider of outsiders to the people of God. Peter had enough humility to stand there and proclaim that even though he had always considered himself to belong to the nation of chosen people, he now understood that God didn't differentiate between nations every type of person could be welcomed into God's people. And Peter had enough confidence to tell the story of what God had done in Jesus, and then enough openness to recognize when the Holy Spirit decided that was enough and filled the people and the place. The very people who had been in charge of keeping the boundaries between who was God's and who wasn't, 
what was good enough and what wasn't, what counted as faith and what didn't, were surprised by the movement of the Spirit among these people who had literally only just begun. None of them were circumcised, none had studied, none had made a statement of faith. All they had was Cornelius' vision in his prayer and Peter telling the briefest of highlights of Jesus' life. And suddenly the Spirit came while Peter was still talking. He hadn't even finished. Just as the Spirit had come to those who had been born into the chosen people and raised on the scriptures and walked with Jesus in his earthly ministry and broke bread with him after the resurrection, the same Spirit to these definitely not the same people. What else then could they do except come down from that faith fortress they had built and make room for God's new thing? Yes, it would require leaving behind the safety of a place to retreat to when challenged, a six feet above contradiction height from which to look down on the world. Yes, it would require building a new life of faith with a different floor plan and more rooms and easier access. Yes, people would think they were crazy and abandoning the Bible. Yes, there would be opposition from those who had not seen the Spirit moving among this community for themselves. And also, what else could they do? God, who is living and active and always doing a new thing, was on the move. Their only other choice was to stick with what they knew and were comfortable with, knowing it was too small for what God had in mind. And ultimately, they would be left behind while, the, while God expanded the kingdom without them. How often we, like Peter, have done our best to build on a firm foundation and ended up building a fortress that looks down on everyone else without room for God to bring more people in. The question then is whether we, like Peter, trust God enough to follow when we're called somewhere unexpected and have enough humility to admit that our understanding or interpretation or tradition doesn't line up with what God is doing now and then have confidence to share the story of Jesus and openness enough to let the Spirit do whatever the Spirit is going to do. The history of the church sadly leans more toward fortresses than faith with room to expand. And it shows as that exclusion plays toward its natural end of people believing our faith irrelevant, a museum piece to be visited and marveled at, maybe a few picturesque photos taken, a laugh or two at what people used to be like, and then left behind with the other holiday snaps. But our God is not, in fact, trapped in the pages of a book that was finished 2,000 years ago. Our God is not, in fact, calling us to pull up the drawbridge and hide on our mountaintop, relying only on that foundation, but never shining the light that goes with being a city on a hill. There has to be more room for God to be alive and for us to follow, or else the tourists are right, our faith is dead. Peter learned that our human categories are not God's categories. Who's in and who's out does not depend on any of the things that we use to define people. Who is in and who is out is entirely up to the Holy Spirit, not to us. And, well, it would be wise for all of us to come down from our faith fortresses and build a bigger house. God is on the move. May it be so. Amen.
Let us pray. You astound us, O God, with your generosity. You freely fill the world with your creativity. You speak your word to all who will listen. You pour out your spirit without waiting for us to ask. We give you thanks for all the ways you give yourself to us. In life, in death, in resurrection, in community, in calling. And we bring ourselves to you, all our joys and concerns carried in our hearts, minds, and bodies in these days, trusting in your generous love to enfold them in your care. For those who have found themselves on the outside of the lines and boxes and categories, and for those who feel they need to draw them, for those who only admit one way to be faithful, and for those who are overwhelmed by the breadth of your grace, for those who hunger in this world of abundance, and those who hunger for you, yet cannot find a place among your people, for those who are trying to figure out how to be faithful in complicated circumstances, and those whose faith is fragile and needs tending. For those who are on our hearts this day, beloveds near and far, situations and concerns in the world, joys and hopes, fears and prayers. We offer our lives, O oh God, trusting you will gather us up into your resurrection life, guiding us in giving, in serving, in speaking, in listening, in caring. Through the power of your Spirit who blows where she will, in the name of your Son Jesus who lives again, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us the wrong we have done, as we forgive those who have wronged us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Go to let your life, as well as your word, be a witness to the good news that Christ is alive and the Spirit is moving, not trapped in the past, but present here today. And as you go, may the Spirit of God go above you to watch over you. May the Spirit of God go beside you to be your companion. May the Spirit of God go before you to show you the way and behind you to push you into places you might not go alone. And may the Spirit of God go within you to remind you that you are loved more deeply than you can possibly imagine. May the fire of God's love burn brightly in you and through you into the world. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.